So let's talk about how, how Jump works and what's so different about what, what it is you do. Um, it's not really difficult. It's not a difficult program to do, but it, it starts with the belief that that the brain is, you know, there's more and more results. There are more and more results in cognition now that suggest the brain's way more plastic than we ever believed. That you can see changes even in, a, in, a, in adult brains, um, and I've seen that in hundreds of students now. I've taken students from re remedial stream to academic stream. So the, the beginning is the belief that it's worth working with these kids who are challenged, who are struggling, that there's something you can do about it, and that there's an analogy is in complex systems, like a chemical solution, you add reagent one drop at a time, nothing happens, and then the whole thing changes color with one drop. Most systems in nature are complex like that. Uh, there's a saying in complexity theory that more is different. It's not just like you think if you're going to add one drop at a time, you just get an incremental change in color or a little more of that behavior, but you can see these leaps where the, the whole system changes. And I've seen that in many kids who appear to be at the limit of their ability. Then with one drop, they'll suddenly leap to a whole new level of behavior or talent or ability. If you're not willing to add those drops rigorously, if you don't believe there's any point, if you think you're just going to be spoon feeding the kid forever, then then you'll never see those kind of non-linear, I call it emergent ability or emergent intelligence. You'll never see that if, you're if, if the belief isn't there. So that's the beginning. And then knowing how to add those drops rigorously. How do you, if a child can't see something or get something, instead of assuming it's their fault, that they'll just never get it or they've got that kind of brain, see if you've misunderstood how they're perceiving things. See if there's a simpler way you can explain it. See if you can build on a talent they have. All of those things, just try and get them moving forward somehow. <laughs> And you'll find that the momentum builds and builds, and gradually you may see some of those changes where they actually become mathematical. They start thinking mathematically. So those are the two main components: is, is believing that it's you know always trying to find a way forward, and then get having the resources or tools to, to help the kids move forward. So that means knowing the math, knowing how to break it down, or whatever subject you're teaching. The results aren't just about being able to get math right. It seems to right. kind of trigger uh, other effects. Yeah, yeah. we unfortunately have not had the resources. We're a charity and we're, we're growing very quickly now, but I always thought we would have, and we will soon have lessons outside of mathematics. So we're writing a whole series of books, Math and Nature, Math and Art, showing how patterns and connections are, are in every subject. But even if you just take care of the math and get the kids believing they can do that, um, We've seen big changes in attention, the kids' ability to pay attention, confidence, uh, willingness to engage in difficult things in any subject. And this has been confirmed, like there's a report from London, and some, uh, um, a school board in London, England used JUMP in a two-month pilot as an experiment. And it's quite a stunning report. It's on our website. And it's, um, the teachers said that the confidence and the behavior tend to spill over in other subjects. And we've, we've seen that ourselves in, in JUMP pilots in Canada. You know, one of the great things about math, I, I, people think it's the most difficult subject. I think it isn't, but people think it is. And once you convince a kid that they can do math, then they tend to believe they, you know, they're smart in any area. Where if you just show them to draw or something, they wouldn't necessarily think they were smart and, or talented everywhere. But when they think they can do math, it, it really has a very fast effect elsewhere. And the, the unfortunate thing for me is, like, I love teachers. I've, I've worked with some phenomenal teachers, but many of them are suffering themselves because they don't know how to reach the lower part of the class. They're not given the tools of the training, and they suffer from it because then they have all these kids who are either depressed or if they're really some of the most resilient kids will do anything they can to disrupt the class to try and divert attention from the fact that they don't know anything. Uh, so teachers are really suffering from the way they're being forced to teach mathematics and by not knowing how to close the gap. Once you do that, you have a different classroom. One of the things that the ideas in the book is that test scores really don't say as much about the student as they do about the ability of the teacher to teach. Right. And as soon as I read that, I went, oh, oh yeah, that's, yeah. Right. <laughs> I got quite indignant for a moment. Well, yeah, we've, we've given tests to grade three classes that, that were well beyond their grade level, and the kids who missed the test begged to write it because they knew it wasn't going to be a punishment or a ranking. It, they knew they were prepared for it and that we wouldn't give the test until they were ready to show off on it. So that's how tests should be used. And if a teacher has the right materials and training and, and, and um, philosophy, I think, then they can pretty much ensure that every kid or virtually every kid will do well. You can use that momentum uh, to 
move forward much more quickly through the curriculum than you could imagine. But if you have the opposite system where you assume there's a natural bell curve and where two-thirds of the class is not going to get an A or a good mark, those kids will either convince themselves they're stupid or the subject's stupid. And then you've got to drag on the class. You spend all kinds of time making up for disruptive behavior, um, reteaching things because you've never assessed what the kids knew to begin with, and mistake piles on mistake until sometimes you can't even tell what the kids don't know. It's just a very inefficient way of teaching we have now, the assumption that there'll be a bell curve, rather than the assumption that everyone should be able to get this, with very few exceptions. Those kids may need a bit of extra help, but the vast majority should be able to get it if it's taught well and broken down. Um, and there's no need for bell curve. The book is The End of Ignorance, Multiplying Our Human Potential. I've been speaking with the author, John Mighton. There's a website, too, that people should That's right. try. In it's uh, Jump Math all one word dot org. We also have a, a book fund. We actually can give subsidies to some teachers if they can't afford the program. So they can check that out on the website too. And The End of Ignorance is published by Canop Canada.